I'm going to get right into our message this morning because at the end of the message we have communion and after that we have our potluck, so we have a lot going on here this morning. In case you haven't been here for the past three weeks, this is actually the fourth Sunday in a series of teachings on the end times. For the first two weeks, we've looked at Jesus' words as we found them in Matthew chapter 24. And I guess I would just encourage you maybe to do two things. One is when you get home at some point this week, if you haven't read Matthew 24, if you haven't been here, read Matthew 24, read Matthew 25. Read those two chapters because Jesus talks about the end times. These are texts that were written long, long ago, but when you look at them, you would think they were written yesterday or last night. They are just so real and so relevant, if you will, for our times today. You'll see these texts and you look at all of the things that, it's, that are talked about in there, and all you got to do is watch one newscast and lay the text up against the New York Times, if you will, and, and they, they parallel each other. There's so much going on that was predicted. And in Matthew 24, the first section, there's three sections. The first section, Jesus talks about the future. He talks about the wars, the famines, the earthquakes, the sin, the false prophets, people leaving the faith. And it says, the love of many will grow cold. We see that, don't we? Sometimes I wish there were just a, a Holy Spirit revival in this land. And that the church would just get passionate again about its mission. And what's its mission? What does Jesus call us to do? He just says, go out and make disciples. And I think one of the biggest challenges for the church is to get out. But if we could just get out, if each one of us would just make a difference in one person's life, we could change a lot of people. But to get out means to get out of our comfort zone too, Right? I know we, you know, I was in Chicago Friday and people came up to me and tried to hand me little tokens. I don't know what religion they were from. And other people had tracks and stuff on the corner and all that. And honestly, a lot of people are turned off by that today. They're turned off by religion. But I'll tell you what people aren't turned off by. They're not turned off by love. Jesus says, love me above all and love your neighbor as yourself. If we just really love the way Jesus called us to love, I think we would we would have an impact that we can't begin to imagine. It's just simply by showing up and loving somebody. By going out of our way and just showing up in a unique way and just loving people. People never get sick of being loved. But Jesus talks about this future. He talks about people growing cold. And I say, let's warm it up a little bit. Let's warm it up with love. In that second section, Jesus talks about his return. He talks about the sun and the moon. They're not going to shine anymore. There's going to be no more light. The stars are going to fall. The earth is going to shake. The clouds are going to be rolled back. The trump's going to re resound. And the Lord will descend. We looked at that last week. And then in the third section, Jesus tells about remaining watchful. And I'm going to repeat some things this morning because I think they're incredibly important. I think they're crucial to our understanding of the faith and understanding what's at stake when it comes to eternity. So if you've heard this before, I'm going to ask you to listen to it again because I'm going to repeat some things, not only because I believe that they're worth repeating, but professionals tell us that for something to really sink in, you have to tell it seven times. Those of us who are parents know exactly what you mean, right? But it's true for adults too. In the business world I came from, we had a methodology. Tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them, and then tell them what you told them. And hopefully they'll remember. So this morning I'm going to tell you what I told you, and you may hear it again in the next couple of weeks because I think it's so important to every one of us that not only do we hear, but that we understand it. That it makes the 12-inch connection between the head and the heart because that's where the disconnect is. I think most people, I shouldn't say most people, but people who miss God's blessings, people who miss God's plan for their life, miss it by 12 inches. They may live 100 years old, but some of them miss God's blessing by 12 inches because they know it in their head, but they don't live it in their heart. What if you get to the finish line and you realize you missed it by 12 inches? You see what I'm saying? 
I want you to really process what I'm going to share again this morning. In that third section, Jesus says, watch, be watchful. Be watchful. And he even says words like, I've warned you. I've warned you. When we get to heaven, we can't claim ignorance. When we stand at the gates, we can't claim we didn't know if we've been warned. And Jesus says, I've warned you. And then in this section, in Matthew 24, Jesus says time after time again, he says, I'm coming back, but you don't know when. He says, for the hour of my return is unknown, right? Time after time after ten, he says, you don't know when, but he gives pictures of watching. Be ready and be watching. He gives three examples. He says, like the people in Noah's day, they knew the flood was coming, they see Noah build the ark. You couldn't miss it if you lived in Noah's town. The sign was there, but nobody wanted to believe it was raining. And when it started raining, they were still partying and having banquets and having weddings and having fun. And they're like, let the old man and his animals go in the boat. When the rain came down, it was too late, wasn't it? And then he gives us a story in Matthew 24. He talks about two, two men who were working side by side in the field. And it says, one of them is taken and the other is left behind. It says two women were grinding mill at the fl- at, or grinding flour at the mill together. One of them taken, one of them left behind. And the question I had that week was, which one are you? The one taken or the one left behind? And then last week I pressed this even further and I said, I, 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 I positioned this question for you and I said, are you a believer or are you a follower? Are you a believer or are you a follower? See, when the books are opened and all is revealed, what is it that we're going to hear? I did share the good news that we are not saved by our works. We're saved by grace through faith. But I also shared that works are going to be a measuring stick. They're an indicator of the depth of our relationship as well as a measuring stick for the rewards that we're going to get. Why do I say that? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. These words of the Apostle Paul. He says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Can you picture that one day? Every single one of us. We will not escape standing before the judge and have to give an account. So why? Because each of us is going to receive what is due for the things done. You can circle that word done. You see how works are important? There's going to be a book that's going to reveal the things that we did. Where? Well, in the body. While we're here on this earth, whether they're good or bad, we're going to be rewarded for our works. So back to the question, are you a believer or are you a follower? What does that mean? Well, let me go back and share this, what I shared last week, because I think it's really important. Believers believers believe, they trust. I believe there's a God. I trust God. Followers follow. See, you can be a believer and not follow. I can believe somebody's here, but I don't necessarily have to follow them. I know they might be real, but I don't have to follow them. And we could spend a whole message on this, and I I don't want to go there, but to keep it simple, I think you can see the difference. There's a difference between belief and following. Following is taking belief to a whole new level. If you look at the Scripture and you look at that, the last words of Jesus, Jesus' last words should be our first concern. Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples. Make disciples. Followers, the disciples followed. The disciples just didn't believe. The disciples followed, didn't they? There was a cost to the disciples. And I just think that if we're following, there has to be a cost to our faith, isn't there? If there is no cost, what is it worth? What does it mean to follow? Followers are faithful. Followers are faithful. Whether the going is easy or difficult, they don't quit. Followers praise him in the calm and in the storm, even when he leads them or allows them into the storm. 
the 12 men, 12 weeks, one purpose, we're learning that. We're learning the cost of what it means to be a disciple. We looked at the story of how Jesus was led into the wilderness and was tempted for 40 days. If Jesus was led into the wilderness and tempted for 40 days, who do we think we are that we could not be tempted or escape that same kind of temptation that Jesus did? You see the cost? But they follow. They're faithful even when it's inconvenient or means changing plans. Followers respond to the promptings and the challenges that are in front of them. How many of us get a prompt? We hear on Sunday morning the call for volunteers and we go, oh yeah, maybe I should do that. And then Monday we don't. I mean, Monday it's back to normal. Followers follow the promptings and the challenge that are in front of them. Followers put others first. They put themselves second. Others first. They are servants. Servants. And followers surrender. Thy will be done as opposed to my will. Followers' lives are summed up in this. Complete obedience. Followers are world changers. They're world changers. They bring hope. Wherever Jesus showed up, things changed, didn't they? Whenever Jesus showed up on the, che- on the scene, lives changed, the situation changed, attitudes changed, everything changed when Jesus showed up. When we show up, things should look different if we're truly being Jesus. True followers pursue a deeper relationship now and they look forward to the eternal wor- word, the eternal rewards ahead. That's where we're at this morning. The eternal rewards ahead. I want to share two things with you this morning. I want to share a promise of heaven and I want to share pictures of heaven. First, the promise. Look at John 14 with me. Starting in verse 1, it says, Don't let your hearts be troubled. How many of you have your heart trouble in this morning? Should I quit now? We all have trouble, right? There's just stuff going on in this world. While we live in this world, Jesus says, we're going to have trouble, right? But take heart because I've overcome this world. Don't let your hearts be troubled. They had trouble back then. It says, but don't let your hearts be troubled. Here's why. Yes, you believe in God. Believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. You start getting this picture of heaven. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. John gives us a really clear picture there. John was with Jesus. He gives us a really clear picture there that he, God is preparing a home for us. It's not about this world, but he's preparing a home for us in heaven. And then verse 4 says, you know the way. You can circle those two words, the way. Why do I say that? Because just two verses later, John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way. I'm the way. You know the way. He's standing there. He says, I'm the way. Not only that, but I'm the truth and I'm the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. If you can picture this before Jesus dies, he's with his disciples and he's telling them, this, yeah, this world's a mess, there's all this stuff, but, but, but don't get too hung up on all of that because one day it's going to be so much grander because my Father is preparing this place. My Father's got plans for me to leave you, go there, reign with Him. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to be with you while I'm gone, but one day we're going to see each other again. And one day the things of this world are going to be no more and it's going to look totally different. Are you with me? When you look at how the gospel comes together, you get this grand and glorious picture of what is to come. And John gives us a picture of the picture that he receives of what heaven is going to be like. I want to share that with you this morning. Look at this. Revelation 21. When you go all the way to the end of the Bible, we started in the beginning in the garden and we get back to when it's all going to be made new. And we get to Revelation 21, we get to the end and, and, and really the Bible is saying, then this is going to be your new beginning. It may be the end of the Bible, but it's going to be the new beginning. And look at the picture we get. Starting in 21, verse 1, it says, Then I saw a new heaven 
and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death. There will be no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I'll give water without cost from the spring of water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all of this. And I will be their God and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, all liars, they'll be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This will be the second death, or this is the second death. Then jump down to verse 15. It says, Then the angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city. Its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurements, and it was 144 cubits thick. The wall was made of jasper, the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh hyacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Pictures of heaven. Look at verse 21. I just want to look at a few things in here this morning with you. It says, John saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and earth had passed away. It's a fulfillment of the prophecy in Isaiah 65. This isn't about renewal or replacement. This is about renewal. It's not about replacing what's here, but it's about complete renewal. Jump down to 21, 2 and 3. In Matthew 24, I talked about the temple. I showed you pictures of the temple. The temple was everything in its day. It says there's going to be a new Jerusalem, a holy city where God is going to be with his people. It says the temple is coming down. God is the temple. Jesus is coming back. God is going to be with us. Isn't that what we celebrate at Christmas? Emmanuel, God with us. God is going to come back. It's heaven coming to us. Just like in the beginning. It's like going back to the Garden of Eden where if we really were to look at Revelation, we'd see the trees. We'd look at the trees. We'd look at the river. We'd look at the fruit. Everything that was in the beginning is going to be restored and life is going to flow through it. When Adam and Eve were in the garden, didn't Jesus come to them in the garden and want to be with them? God's desire has always been to be with His people, to have communion, to have fellowship with His people. And it says in the end he's going to come back and it's going to happen. Do you believe that? A couple of you? Yeah, we believe that, right? Isn't that our hope? See, we need to have 
cross-eyed vision and, and, and heaven-focused vision on what is to come and not get so hung up with this world. We're just passing through, aren't we? The new Jerusalem is God coming from heaven a gift to his people. Look at Revelation 21, verse 4. Look at these promises. It says, in this place there will be no more tears. Maybe I won't get weepy when I preach. If I get to preach in heaven. I don't know. But it says there will be no more tears. I have to think, what are the things that we cry about? Our emotions, the disappointments in life. When we get kicked down, when we're betrayed, when we're hurt, when we're stressed out, when we're angry, when people hurt us, we cry, there's tears, no more tears, no more mourning. You know, I think about, I think about the De Winters and I think about the Brocks this week who just spent time mourning the loss of loved ones, mourning and celebrating all at the same time. The picture of death on earth, but knowing their loved one is at home in heaven. But yet there's mourning, isn't there? Our hearts just ache because, especially those who, who lost a loved one at, at a young life and maybe doing life alone and lost a spouse or lost children. The heart just aches and aches and aches because the pain doesn't go away, does it? It says in heaven there will be no more mourning. And then it specifically says there will be no more crying. Crying over losses, disappointments, and hardships. No more pain. No more big C. Huh? No more cancer. No more diseases. No more suffering, no more battles, and no more death. Life's final war is death, isn't it? All the stuff that robs us, robs us of our peace and life, they're going to be conquered. It says, for the old order has passed away. What did Jesus say on the cross? It is finished. Well, you know that song, it is finished. Many of these things that I just mentioned are in that song. It's taken care of. They will be no more, done away with good forever. And then verse 20, or 21, verse 7 says this, those who are victorious, those who are victorious will inherit all this. And I will be their God and they will be my children. Well, when I see that word victorious, another word that comes to mind is war or battle, huh? Victors win the battles of life. It's a reminder that Christianity isn't for the faint at heart, is it? We're at war with the world. But as Paul writes in Philippians 3.20, he says, we're not citizens of this world. We're citizens of heaven and we await a Savior from there. In 1 Peter 1 verse 4, it says, for we have an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade. That is God's promise to his followers. In Revelation 21, 22, it says there'll be no more temple. In its day, the temple was everything. The temple is going to be God. The throne of God is going to be in the city. There's going to be no more light. God's going to be their light, it says. And God's people will reign with him forever and ever. When I listen to the kids, what's their fear? Thunder and lightning. When does thunder and lightning happen? Usually at night. There will be no more night. We've seen that twice in the last three weeks in the scriptures that I read. The sun will no longer shine, the moon will no longer shine, the stars will fall from the sky, and God is going to be our light. We will not live in darkness. When you go back and you look at the Christmas story, we'll look at that in a few weeks, it's for the people in its day have seen a great light. Huh? We're going to see a great light one day. A light that I don't think we can even begin to understand how bright and how beautiful and how rich it's going to be. And in 27, a good reminder, it says nothing impure, no one impure will ever enter into it. Only those who overcome the fleshly desires of this world. 
sin and immoral, immoral immorality will have no presence in heaven. So you're getting the picture. It's really what I want you to get this morning, the picture. Just a picture of what's in store, what's ahead. What eternity might be like to live in this land, to live in this place. With, I'm not much into jewelry. But my goodness, every kind of precious stone is there. And streets of gold? Seas of crystal? Thrones of pure white? With the great judge, the king, my Savior and Lord, reigning day and night? Bowing down in worship? Reunited with saints who have gone on before? Reunited with loved ones who have gone on before? Man, we should be partying. In a celebrative way of what's to come. That's our hope. That's our hope. In the beginning it was good. Friend, this will be good again. It is going to be good again. So what's the challenge? Where does this leave us? Four really quick things. Number one, follow. Don't just believe. Don't just trust. Yeah, those are starting points. Follow. What does God want you to do? What is God prompting you to do? Where does He want you to get involved? What does He want from you? What does He want to give you so that you might experience life to the fullest now? And what does he want to give you now so he can credit you later for the things you've done well in the body? What I'm really challenging you is to follow more closely. See, when you're following closely, all you should see is his back. And don't ever let him get so far ahead of you or you so far behind that you lose sight. Follow. Overcome and pursue. Number two, watch. Be watching, it says. Stand on the promises. Be ready. And three is experience the already, but not yet. We say we in the Lord's Prayer, we, we, we say the words, Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth, where we are now, as it is in heaven. The kingdom now. The already, but not yet. Experience His goodness now. And then four is grasp God's plans and His promises for you. Take hold of His plans and His promises. Maybe the best way to celebrate that this morning is by celebrating communion. This is the already but not yet, isn't it? This is the kingdom. This is Christ's body and blood already. Christ with us. Some of you maybe were members or were in churches at one point in your life or across a communion table that said, do this in remembrance. Huh? A celebrative remembrance. That means remember with our mind, but it also means reconnect. Remembering. Reconnecting with Christ. On the night in which before he was betrayed, night he was betrayed, day before his crucifixion, Jesus was with his disciples having dinner. They knew where he was going. He had told them that he was going back to his father because his father was preparing a place, not just for him to sit at the right hand of God the Father, but a place for them for one day they could be there too. But he left them with a reminder, that remembrance, a celebrative meal where they could commemorate his life and where they could celebrate the future. Oh, there was going to be pain. There was going to be mourning. There was going to be crying. There was going to be agony. There was going to be a battle the next three days, wasn't there? Because he was crucified. But do you see how God brings good out of bad? Was it a good Friday or was it a bad Friday? Both. And then came Easter. Huh? And this morning, God calls us to remember these things. Christ, body and blood. So on that night, Jesus took bread and he broke it when he was with his disciples and he said this was his body and he told them to take it, to eat it, to remember and believe 
and his body was broken, was offered for all, not some, but all of our sins. After that meal, Jesus took a cup and he offered that cup to his disciples and he said that this was his blood. It was a sign of a new covenant, a new future, promises. And he told them to take it and drink it because it was a reminder of the forgiveness of all of their sins. This morning, I'm going to invite all of us to come forward and celebrate. Celebrate what scriptures tell us. Celebrate the promises of the already, the promises of heaven. And I would invite you, if you are a follower, maybe you're a believer, I'm encouraging you to take your belief to a new level, to really trust and follow, fully surrender. But this morning, if you are that person, if you're a follower, a believing follower, and you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, and that his promises of heaven are for you, then I want to invite you to come up this morning and participate, partake of the elements this morning as we celebrate God's love for us now and the future that he has in store for us. So I'm going to invite Mick to come forward, and I believe you guys are playing during the communion or, or softly playing during the communion. And those who are serving communion, if you would come forward and do that, we'll have three stations. If you will each exit to the your left and come up to the station and take communion and then enter into your seats from the right, we'd like to serve that at this time. Isn't God good? You feel refreshed this morning? You feel a little more hope? you feel encouraged? Do you feel like God loves you? Then let's give him thanks and pray together. God, we just want to give you thanks for this time. Thanks for this reminder from Scripture that you have plans for us far beyond what we can ever imagine or expect or even deserve. God, this morning we celebrate your love. Love that is made so clear to us in the Word love that is made so clear to us in your people here, in our praises, in our professions, in our love for one another and in our love for you. Lord, I pray that this morning each person here who came disturbed might be comforted, that they would leave with joy and hope and expectant of the good that you have planned for them. Lord, as we leave this place, may our celebration not stop but only begin as we live it out and share it with those around us. So Lord, equip us and send us out to be your light, to be those beacons of hope, to be vessels that share with the world around us. Lord, we ask that as we leave, you would not only make things all thing new, but make us new, renew us. Fill us with a fresh sense of your spirit and send us out with the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and equip us to do all things through the power of the Holy Spirit. And all who agreed said, Amen. Have a blessed day.